Our lesson for tonight, uh, for the message tonight, comes from Exodus it's chapter 6, verse 28, through chapter 7, verse 7. It says, Now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything that I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, Since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my division, my peoples, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did this, did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And so our incredible story begins. And so tonight I want to propose that we look at the Exodus story with fresh eyes, that we peer through different lenses tonight, new lenses. See, I believe that the Exodus story is, the, the primary purpose of the Exodus story is for God to reveal himself to us. Who is God? What is God's true character? So let's keep these questions in mind as we go through the narrative. It may be one that you're familiar with, it may be one that you're not. But it starts with a Hebrew child named Moses. And Moses was born into a time of slavery and genocide. You see, the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians, by Pharaoh. And Pharaoh became scared. He was worried that the Israelites were becoming too many in number. That is, if Egypt were ever attacked, that the slaves would take the side of the attackers, and the overwhelming numbers would defeat Pharaoh's forces. And so Pharaoh made a decree. He said that every Hebrew child that is born be tossed into the Nile. It was truly a terrible, terrible time to be a part of uh, this nation, to be living in this time. Um, and so Moses was born, and he was tossed into the Nile. But instead, he was tossed in in a basket. And so Moses floated down the Nile, and he happened upon the Pharaoh's daughter. And like any compassionate person, the Pharaoh's daughter took Moses in. And so Pharaoh's daughter had this new Hebrew child, and she wanted a Hebrew woman to help raise him. And so she sent her slaves out, and the slaves found Moses' birth mother. And so Moses' mom actually did get to raise Moses. And we see that Moses had a very different childhood. He was raised in the courts of Pharaoh, but at the exact same time, he was very familiar with his Hebrew heritage. And so years later, many years later, Moses was a man, and he was walking around his people. He was walking around, and he noticed an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. And this enraged Moses, and Moses wound up killing the Egyptian. And at this, Pharaoh found out and said, I'm going to kill Moses. So Moses did the natural thing and fled Egypt. And he fled out into the desert and joined a nomadic tribe. And as he got there, he um, found his wife. He started a family. Um, and he had kids. And so while Moses was out in the wilderness, um, time had progressed. And the Pharaoh who wanted Moses dead, that Pharaoh passed away. And so one day, while Moses was tending to his flocks, God called him through a burning bush. The Israelites had been grumbling about their slavery under this new Pharaoh, and God heard their prayers, and he remembered their covenant, uh, his covenant with those people. And so God called Moses to free the Israelites, and he did it through an incredible burning bush. And this is truly where our Exodus story begins. See, Moses and Aaron, they went to Pharaoh in the name of God, and they demanded 
that Pharaoh release the Israelites. But Pharaoh, being Pharaoh, a self-proclaimed god, a, he had a, a mighty ego, um, he had a very stubborn heart. Uh, Pharaoh wasn't going to just simply release all of his workforce. And so this starts a reoccurring theme throughout the rest of the story. Moses and Aaron are asked to prove God's authority. Pharaoh says, prove that your God is truly this God you say. And they do. And they do it over and over again through numerous signs and numerous plagues. It starts right after chapter 7 when I read. It starts as they're in the courts with Pharaoh. And the first one, Pharaoh says, well, if your God is truly this powerful, Aaron, throw down your staff and turn it into a snake. And crazily enough, Aaron does it, and it's a snake. But Pharaoh has some magicians in his court who also know this trick. And so he calls his magicians out. And his magicians, they throw their staffs on the floor. And their staffs turn into snakes. But Aaron's staff eats the magician's staffs. Can you imagine what was going on on the floor? But it says, yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them just as the Lord had said. Moses said, you see, our God is bigger than anything you have to offer. And Pharaoh still said, I'm not letting your people go. So this is where we see the first plague step in. And the first plague was God turned the water of the Nile into blood. Not a good thing. The people obviously freaked out, and they had to dig wells in order to find clean drinking water. Things were not good for the Israelite or for the Egyptians. And it plainly says, And Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord said. So even water to blood wasn't going to stop Pharaoh. The second plague came, and it was frogs. This one must have been nasty, because as we read, we hear that Moses prays to God to get rid of these frogs. And God does. And it says, But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, that God did in fact kill all of the frogs, he hardened his heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. And so our third plague comes, and it's gnats. Bunches of gnats. Pharaoh still. Pharaoh's heart was hard. He would not listen, just as the Lord had said. Our fourth plague comes. Again, must have been another nasty one, because Pharaoh shows an instance of, maybe I'll let you go. And Moses begs God to take uh, away these flies. And he does. But then finally, but this time, Pharaoh's heart hardened, and he would not let the people go. The fifth plague comes. It is the death of the livestock. All of the livestock in, the, in Egypt died except the Israelites. It says, Pharaoh sent men to investigate and found not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died. Yet his heart was unyielding, and he would not let the people go. The sixth plague, boils. Everybody came down with boils. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said to Moses. The seventh uh, plague was hail. A huge storm came. Hail came, destroyed all of the crops in Egypt. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts, so Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not let the Israelites go just as the Lord had said through Moses. The eighth plague. It's still going. The eighth plague. Locusts. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go. And the ninth plague. I love how the NIV puts it. It was darkness came over the land. A darkness that can be felt. Darkness that can be felt. It says, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. And then finally we come upon the tenth plague. And the tenth and the last plague was that the firstborn son of all men and animals would die. And so the angel of death came, and it killed every firstborn in Egypt. Only those who were spared were the Israelites, who were told to take the blood of an innocent lamb, a sacrifice, and spread it over their door. And the angel would pass over their houses. And so we had the Passover. And so it seems that this was the final straw. Pharaoh had given up. He was broken. He lost his.
his firstborn son. And so he lets the Israelites go. But before we know it, he changes his mind. And Pharaoh gathers an army. He gathers an army together and he chases the Israelites out into the desert. Now there are so many things we could look at from this story. But I hope it was obvious that I want to look at Pharaoh's hardened heart. So what is going on with this guy? We see from the text that at some point, he simply had a hardened heart. His heart was hard. At another point, he chooses to be stubborn. And then finally, God creates in him a hardened heart. Now this can be a very difficult text to deal with. There are all sorts of implications involving our free will and whether or not God creates in, some, creates in us something that can lead to our own destruction. And those are all sermons or, I would argue, exegetical books worth of information in their own right. But here is what we can know tonight. Pharaoh comes from a line of kings who are egocentric. They were stubborn men. It is how his father ruled. It is how he knows to run a country. His heritage created in him a hardened heart from a very young age. God knew this, and Moses was very aware of this as Moses pleaded with God to take this task away from him. Um, that Moses said, I'm simply not the man for this job. And so right from the start, we see that it's Pharaoh's own decision to be obstinate towards God's authority. Having a hard heart is being stubborn. It's not being open to God's point of view. Even when you're being persuaded or guided or inflicted with plagues. I like to think of it as if uh, you were placed in a river and you're heading towards a waterfall. But you choose to swim with the current anyways. Pharaoh's hardened heart our hardened hearts. They set us on a path towards destruction. And so here on the screen, I've got a picture of the Victoria Falls. They're on the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia. They're considered the, the largest falls in the world, not necessarily in width or height, but in volume, sheer volume of water that comes off. And so there's another picture just to get uh, reference on how huge these are. And then there's one last picture of, I mean, they're huge, right? Can you imagine finding yourself in the midst of rushing water headed towards that fall when you choose to swim with the current anyway? Now this is precisely what Pharaoh does. Water to blood? No, I'm going to still swim. Frogs everywhere? Nope. Gnats? Just keep swimming. Flies? Nope. And all the while, Moses... Aaron, even Pharaoh's own court magicians, they're on the banks, and they are throwing out ropes. They are warning Pharaoh of this impending danger. They are begging him to change his course, to just swim to shore. The livestock die, boils emerge, hail falls, locusts appear, darkness envelops, and then the firstborn are killed. This last devastating plague brings Pharaoh right up to the edge of the fall. He seems to get scared. He's tired. He's devastated. So he lets the Israelites go. But only for a moment. It is at this point that Pharaoh's hardened heart causes him to leap over the edge. You see, at some point... Our hardened hearts will lead us to destruction. What is that phrase? If, if, you, if you've made your own bed, now you must sleep in it. When we tell God, when we prove to God that we are stuck in our ways, that it is our way or no way, that we refuse to change, eventually God is going to grant us that wish. I love how C.S. Lewis puts it. Quote, there are only two kinds of people in the end on the last day. Those who say to God, God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, 
thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there can be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss joy. Those who seek, find it. Those who knock, the door is open. So looking at this story, what can be revealed about God's character? That he's a sadistic plague creator? No, not at all. I obviously highlighted the numerous accounts of Pharaoh's hardened heart throughout the passage. And so looking at this text through that emphasis, I see a God who demands salvation for his children. I see a God who gives Pharaoh numerous opportunities to repent and soften his heart. I see a God that is so full of love that he gives us free will. He allows us to choose our own paths, even if those paths lead us towards destruction. You see, our story doesn't end at Exodus. Our God loves us so much that he gave his son, he gave himself, so that we can choose life and avoid death and destruction. This picture is crazy, right? This is actually a guy jumping into the edge of the Victoria Falls. And this is the Victoria Falls. It really gives me the willies just thinking about it. Um, and I don't know if you noticed, but my sermon title this evening is called Jesus Swimming Pool. There's a place at the Victoria Falls, and it's called the Devil's Swimming Pool. <laughs> oh, oh. So in this section of the falls, there actually is a natural barrier that is formed, and a pool of water just sits right at the edge of the fall. This wall of rock, it creates a safe haven. The rushing waters, they, they calm down and only a few inches of water slowly pass over the edge at any time. It has become quite the tourist attraction due to its photo opportunity alone. Um, but I propose that they change the name of this place from the Devil's Swimming Pool to Jesus' Swimming Pool. Here, the rushing waters of life, they're calm. A second chance is clearly given. Imminent death has been prevented. So no matter how terrifying that these pictures may look, it is virtually impossible to accidentally fall over the edge at this section of the falls. Or put another way, the only way you can go over is if you choose to go over. So what in your life has your heart hardened? What has caused your heart to be hardened? Where are you blindly swimming with the current? Where, where do you need God's love to enter in and transform you? If you don't know, ask God to show you. If you do know, ask God to show you. Pray about it. Find a close friend and hold one another accountable. Utilize the church, the community of faith. Take hold of their lifeline that they're throwing out to you. Heed their warnings. Accept their help. And do all of this with the peace of knowing that Christ is with you. Through his love, through his love, we can be saved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son.